Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for the nice introduction, Jonas. Um, I'm here today with my colleague, Jeremy. Uh, I'll be giving the first part of the talk, and then Jeremy will be uh, giving the, the second part. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to start very high level uh, by saying a few words about natural language processing. Um, many of you may not be that familiar with this field of research. Um, so the grand goal of this field then is to devise uh, technology that enables computers to make sense of human language. Um, it's been known previously as computational linguistics, also known as language technology. Uh, and it's a fairly young and, and highly interdisciplinary field. So, so ob obviously uh, at its very essence, it merges techniques from, from linguistics, the studies of human language uh, and computer science. Um, nowadays, uh, machine learning is the main methodology for this field of research. So we're borrowing techniques, obviously from statistics, machine learning, mathematics. Uh, to some extent also logic, so knowledge representation, um, these types of, um, of techniques. Um, and as I'm sure you know, uh, NLP has a lot of applications. I'm sure many of you have used software today that is somehow powered by, by natural language processing. So. Uh, from the very simple techniques of grammar spell checking type of thing, machine translation. So Google Translate boasts today of having 500 million users every day. Most of these are uh, non-English speaking. So this is really uh, enabling uh, the sharing of information across, across languages, even though it's far from perfect, uh, right? Um, we see a lot of uh, question answering systems or different types of dialogue systems where you can interact uh, with a computer via human language. Um, chatbots is a hot, hot topic for many, um, for many companies uh, to reach uh, their customers via chat. Um, then you have sort of all the applications that deal with speech. Uh, so either recognizing speech, so going from speech to some sort of textual format or in the other diverse directions of going from text to speech, for instance, so the creation of synthesized speech. Um, and then there's the type area of applications that deal with some sort of uh, information extraction. So there are obviously vast amounts of text available to us um, every day. Uh, and the um, the ability to sort of navigate all that information is contained um, is uh, is a hot research topic. So enabling intelligent information extraction, where you can have the computer read read loads of research articles for you, for instance, and you're able to extract type of relevant and important information for you is a is a sort of um, an important area of application for for NLP. Um, today. And yeah, more or less any application that requires understanding of language that be it textual in its textual form or, uh, or spoken, spoken form. And um, as I said, nowadays, um, most NLP systems are approached, or most NLP tasks are approached as, as classification problems using supervised machine learning. Um, and uh, our field was maybe a little bit later uh, to, uh, to adopt the sort of neural methods um, that have been dominant in image processing for quite a while. But um, this graph here plots um, the uh, number of uh, papers that use neural methods in NLP in the sort of main largest, uh, most prestigious conferences of our field, ACL, EMNLP, and the European and North American ACL um, between the years of 2012 and 2017. So shows obviously a clear, uh, clear increase uh, to the extent that I would I would sort of extrapolate and, and I haven't plotted this for, for the following years, but I would assume that uh, actually nowadays um, this would be a downward trend since nowadays. So this actually registered the number of papers where neural 
was mentioned. Whereas I think it now it's become completely the dominant approach. So you no longer have to state that you have a neural system uh, because this is the kind of default. You would, you would rather have to state that you were doing something traditional or non-neural if, if that was the case. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the backdrop for, <laughs> for this tutorial, uh, the sort of widespread adoption of these neural methods within our field. So um, the plan for, for the rest of the talk is um, I'll go on to say a bit more about um, NLP tasks uh, and, and some challenges that arise from working with language data that, that have kind of directed um, the research uh, in our field for, for, for a while. Um, I'm going to say a few words about sort of uh, success stories um, of neural methods in NLP. And then I'll uh, turn over to Jeremy, who will be discussing various types of neural mo models that are widely used in NLP uh, and talk specifically about transfer learning in, um, in, in, in our area. Of research, and I thought we would um, we would do uh, questions at the end. Uh, it's a little difficult to navigate between questions and the chat and the slides and everything. So uh, please save up your questions um, for for the end, and we'll we'll do a session a question session then. Okay. So I mentioned initially different applications of NLP and that kind of exemplifies the kind of breadth of different NLP tasks. Uh, so NLP is very sort of task oriented in the sense that uh, this grand goal of language understanding has been broken down into many smaller pieces of, of sort of uh, tasks that people work on that have their own sort of standard data sets, evaluation metrics, etc. I mean I'm I'm sure this is fairly standard for most fields that uh, use machine learning. Um, and many NLP tasks uh, today can be seen as extracting somehow structured information from, from unstructured data. So in the form of running text. So I gave this example of, of the vast amounts of text available on the internet. So uh, creating uh, systems that can actually extract various types of information. Uh, from that uh, large repository of knowledge, if you will, uh, is, um, is a very prominent topic in our field. Uh, and this can typically be done by first identifying and categorizing so-called entities in the text. So texts are typically about something, about someone, uh, and the relations that hold between them. So this kind of uh, approach really applies to a lot of different NLP tasks. So I thought I would just give you one concrete example, um, which is the task of sentiment analysis. Um, and that's a, a very large research field within NLP, and it deals with um, the automatic identification of opinions in text. Uh, so Whereas I previously mentioned the task of information extraction, where you want to extract facts from text uh, in the field of sentiment, you are focused on subjective um, information, right? So you want to know, well, how do people feel about the new iPhone, for instance, or uh, about um, a politician or, uh, yeah. There are numerous use cases for, for sentiment analysis where, um, where the main focus is to, to sort of track sentiment over time uh, or and then extract these opinions that, that people have and the targets of this opinion. So how do people feel about a specific entity? In a sense. Um, so just an example here um, from a restaurant review, for instance, one could extract information about a positive attitude towards the salmon sushi. So that's the entity that here consists of two words, right? Um, and a negative sentiment signi signalized by this sentiment expression, not good towards the service uh, of this restaurant, right? So you have a mixed sentiment situation where you have both positive sentiment towards one entity and um, a negative sentiment towards another. 
Uh, and the way that uh, this is often modeled um, is performing some sort of word class, word level class assignments um, in sequence. So this is what we often term as tagging. Uh, and it, this is a type of approach that is applied to many types of NLP tasks. Um, so classifying phonemes and sequences, for instance, sounds, uh, parts of speech, um, named entities, which is the assignment of, of semantic classes. So saying whether a word is, for instance, a person or an organization or something like that. Uh, so here we have uh, a situation where we where there is some structure so there are these entities that consist of more than one word and there are relations between them but we approximate this structure using a uh, word level class assignments of this type so what this means here is that we're we're identifying salmon sushi using this by b and i tags saying that this is the beginning of a positive entity and inside a positive entity and all of these o's are sort of uh, words that are not part of a target, sentiment target. Likewise, the service is identified here as having a negative um, polarity. And so this is the type of approximation uh, of structure that is often used to simplify uh, many types of sequence labeling uh, problems in NLP. Um, so I thought I would say a few words about the challenges that are specific to, um, to NLP, probably in working with, with language data. Um, because, yeah, it's good to know that language is very complex, uh, so it's highly ambiguous for one. So you have uh, both words that mean many different things, and sentences can mean many different things depending on the context. And this is obviously an advantage uh, when you think of language as a sort of communication tool because it makes it very compact uh, and efficient. And it's not a big problem for humans that a word can mean different things. So in this meme here, call, the word call obviously can mean both that you're sort of calling someone over the phone or that you're naming uh, someone. So could you call me a cab? Can mean both, can you telephone for a cab or can you give me the name of a cab? And this is just not a problem for humans. Uh, language is ambiguous and we most we understand each other most of the time. But this obviously uh, makes the computational modeling of, of language fairly, um, uh, fairly challenging. This is something that one needs to deal with the fact that uh, much of the meaning of words or sentences is context dependent. Language is also very variable. So obviously you know that there are very many languages in the world. Uh, so more than 7,000 languages exist. Uh, that's not to say that all of them are uh, large languages. So many of them are, are dying languages is very, with very few speakers, but there's at least a huge variation in, in language that one has to deal with. Um, and even within a language, there is a lot of variation. So there's not one English or Norwegian, but it will depend on, for instance, a dialect or uh, the medium, so genre. So for instance, there's a lot of difference between a, a tweet, so the language found in a, a tweet, and for instance, a hospital journal or a newspaper text, um, to give you some examples. So, so um, this is a challenge for NLP. So if you train your system, for instance, only on news texts, it's going to suffer dramatically if you apply it to tweets. So uh, there's a lot of work in NLP on sort of trying to adapt to various, um, to this variety, uh, variation found in, in, in language. Um, so I mentioned also initially that most NLP tasks are approached as supervised machine learning tasks. And this means that you need uh, training data in our case, unfortunately, manually annotated training data. So we need to have linguists or domain experts actually sit down and sort of manually mark up language uh, input. Um, and that's these data sets that are then produced are, are of very crucial importance for the field. So I would say that today in NLP, the availability of 
data, and in particular annotated data, largely directs research. So it's difficult to work on a problem if there isn't a data set for it, and uh, that will sort of um, guide the research that you can do. Uh, so here's an example of a type of entity classification task where a human is asked to annotate organizations and uh, money mentions in a text. This could, for instance, be for an application that extracts uh, financial information, perhaps from from um, from online news. But this is obviously a very limiting factor, also because having humans sit down and annotate data is very costly and very time-consuming. So um, this is a, a challenge for NLP. Um, another challenge is how to represent language. Uh, input for, for a neural classifier. Um, there's been a lot of focus uh, in NLP on leveraging unlabeled data, because obviously we can't sit down and annotate all the data that we need, so we need to come up with smart ways of, of using raw text or raw speech, uh, so unlabeled data. And this has uh, often been um, categorized uh, as so-called representation learning, um, where obviously one of the sort of promises of neural models is that they can learn how to represent the data in a good way, right? Um, and one of the most important examples of this within NLP and, and one that was um, very sort of central, at least in the in the first years of neural modeling within NLP is um, these word, so-called word embeddings. You've probably heard about word to vec uh, or fast text, which were sort of early uh, examples of, of these low dimensional and dense vector representations of words um, that could be trained on large amounts of unlabeled data. So you could have uh, input representations that capture a lot of the meaning of, of the words. And uh, there were a lot of studies sort of studying um, or researching um, how, how these vector representations um, captured or to what extent they captured sort of the meaning of, of words and phrases in, in language. Um, so the advantage then is that they can be trained on raw amounts of texts, which are sort of readily available. Um, and this is usually set up as a, a very simple text prediction task where one uses the uh, existing words in the text um, to train over. So uh, this is the task of language modeling. We're usually formulated as the task of uh, predicting the next word. Uh, so given the sequence of words, predicting the next word. And so this is a way of making use of the unlabeled data um, by, by this type of self-supervision uh, where properties of the, um, of the text are used as classes. And these uh, word embeddings or the resulting word representations are then used to form the input for, for downstream supervised um, neural network models. Yeah. Um, so I thought I would say a few words uh, on the sort of success of, of these models in NLP because obviously there, there are challenges in working with language, but I think that one of the reasons why you saw this very, or we saw this very widespread adoption of these methods was because they worked really well for many NLP tasks. And we saw sort of great improvements uh, early on. So for machines translation, for instance, was one area where they saw a real boost. And uh, this is just an example. You don't have to read the whole thing, but just to read sort of the first couple of sentences in the pre-neural system and the neural system. And I think it's fairly, um, clear that there's a, a large improvement. So 
So for instance, in the pre-neural uh, output, so this is a text that has been uh, um, translated from Japanese. Uh, so the final sentence is whether the leopard had what the demand at that altitude, there is no that nobody explained. It's almost difficult to understand. Whereas the uh, no one has ever explained what leopard wanted at that altitude is a lot more legible, even though you're sort of missing the, the determiner here is the only sort of real giveaway that this is not uh, a human uh, produced sentence. Um, another area that saw a lot of improvements from the, from the use of neural methods is anything speech related. So this is from, from an example of a text to speech uh, system uh, where the blue blue bar here indicates performance um, with a neural model and this is then compared to kind of upper bound uh, which is the green bar um, which is actually human speech so it's clear that it's sort of uh, narrowing the gap to to human performance uh, in this case um, I know that many here work on image processing, uh, and I think one of the one of the advantages of, of the fact that the NLP is also adopting sort of neural methods is that it's a lot easier to um, to combine image and, and language, right? And you've seen many applications of this, such as visual question answering, uh, where a question can be posed in natural language, and search is then performed uh, over images. Uh, and a response is also produced in, in natural language. So this is clearly a kind of a complex task that, uh, that uh, um, makes use of many different subtasks. So just sort of the interpretation of the question, um, the mapping of natural language uh, concepts to regions of a, a, an image, various types of reasoning, etc. But it's a cool example of, of sort of new tasks that combine image and language. And this combination is, is enabled by, by the fact that both these fields are using the neural models that can be sort of combined. Um, and then finally, many of you have maybe heard about uh, these pre-trained language models that I mentioned already um, from starting from 2018 have shown a, a really uh, great um, performance in, in NLP and all NLP tasks. So it's been kind of before and after, after for, for NLP. Uh, so this is from the first paper from 2018 that proposed the so-called ELMO model. So in the beginning, these models have uh, names uh, after the Sesame Street characters. So there was the ELMO model and the BERT model. Um, and here, these graphs are just show, showing for some sort of different NLP benchmarks. So this is natural language inference, named entity recognition, question answering, co-reference resolution, etc. And it's showing kind of the, uh, the effect of adding this ELMO uh, pre-trained language model. Uh, since then, there have been numerous language models. Uh, so I mentioned BERT, which is maybe the most widely used, at least within research. Uh, you also have GPT-2 GPT and GPT-3 models, uh, which I'm sure, which have gotten a lot of uh, media attention. Uh, so the GPT-2 model was the model that uh, supposedly they did not dare to release because it could be too dangerous. Uh, it was suspected that this was kind of a, a clever media ploy, but uh, uh, it was followed by the GPT-3 model, which was released uh, and has got a lot of media attention and hype, I would say. So this is just an example from Hacker News uh, with sort of uh, headings that mention GPT-3 within a fairly short period of time. Uh, but it's also, uh, these models have also uh, received a lot of scrutiny from our field where we're trying to uh, also understand the limitations. Uh, so as a kind of counter to, to all the hype that we see in the media about these models, understanding language and, and sort of being uh, very close to, uh, to intelligent. Uh, this has sort of um, given rise to several studies um, actually examining the, the, the veracity of those, uh, those statements and to what extent and they can actually be said to understand language. Um, 
last week our group actually released uh, the, the first fully functional Norwegian bird. Um, so this is uh, an exciting, uh, exciting development for people who are working on Norwegian NLP. Um, and yeah, more details uh, are here. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, so that was the blessed uh, point that I was going to make uh, about sort of giving the, the grander or <laughs> more general motivations uh, and background on the use of neural methods for, for NLP. And I'm going to um, let Jeremy take over uh, with some more, uh, we're going to dive a little deeper into, into the modeling uh, part. So do you want to share your screen yep. maybe, Jeremy? Yeah. Yep. Great. OK. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, I'll be talking a little bit about some of the staple deep learning models that we have in NLP. Um, I've seen that there was a couple of tutorials already on convolutional neural networks and some, some GAN related things. So I imagine that most of the beginning things we won't get into in, in too much detail. And I'll only really dive into details of models when I think it might be something maybe more interesting, slightly different in NLP specific. Uh, otherwise, I'll try to give you an idea of maybe what the benefits and limitations of these models are. And maybe when is, it's interesting to use them inside of NLP. So uh, the first thing I'll talk about is convolutional neural networks. Like I said, I've seen, uh, I think everybody knows what this is, having worked with either image or, or speech or something like this. So it's uh, inside of NLP, we, we often use these for classification and things. What we have here is an example from Kim 2014, who used uh, one of the first uses of convolutional neural, neural networks for text classification. And I guess from an intuitive kind of aspect, what you get is that uh, the filters that inside of image kind of move across the images to give you, uh, let's say, specialized filters where you pull out edges. Inside of NLP, the concept, or at least the, the motivation, was that you would be using the same filters to pull out n-grams. So for example, in this, uh, this example we have here, we have wait for as a kind of bigram that's pulled out by one filter, uh, and video and do you have this kind of three trigram uh, that's being pulled out. Uh, that, that's at least the idea. And they, the good thing is they have quite a few benefits. Uh, so for, for the first thing, they're, they're quite fast to train. Uh, as anyone who, who's worked with convolutional neural network, networks knows. Uh, secondly, they're relatively accurate, uh, especially for text classification, they're, they're quite good. Uh, and third, the, these kind of local feature interactions, uh, so the, the size of the, the filters, oftentimes pick up, let's say, um, features that are, are good enough to, to work as well as more complicated features. So even though they're not picking up necessarily a lot of kind of long distance relationships between words and sentences, uh, a lot of times these local interactions between words are enough to know uh, for example, if you're trying to classify the sentiment, if you have not good, that's already enough to know that it's probably going to be a negative sentiment that we're talking about here. Okay. Um, they do, however, have some, some limitations when it comes to natural language processing. Uh, so while in computer vision, you know, it's, it's possible to interpret these models by projecting the filters into image space, then you can kind of look and see, well, <clears throat> get the idea, at least an intuition that these are picking up maybe some edges or that they're picking up little high level features later on in the comment. Inside of NLP, it's a little bit harder to do the same because we're dealing with discrete representations. So you can't just project it right onto the, these word embeddings and see what's going on. Uh, so that's slightly problematic. Uh, and actually, although we have this motivation of CNNs working as kind of highly parameterized in-gram models, uh, it seems like that's actually a bit of an oversimplification. So there's some papers that have, have done work on understanding convolutional neural networks for text classification. And it seems like rather than just picking up in-grams, they actually pick up a whole lot of things. So a lot of times it's, 
it's a mix of ingrams that are there. It's a mix of lack of certain things that are there. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than, than even what, what would have been previously thought. Um, yeah, so like I said, uh, the filters often capture several different kinds of ingrams. So it's more like families of ingrams, which means even whenever you, you find a way to make it interpretable, it's, you still have to interpret those results uh, a little bit further. So it can be a bit complicated to know exactly what's going on. Um, when to use them inside of NLP, uh, the first thing is they're, they're really great. So they're really good baselines uh, for a lot of things because they're fast to tune and fast to train. But they, we also use them a lot for a submodule module and slightly more complex networks. For example, the, the example of Elmo that uh, Lilia talked about, they use this as a character level information so these character level CNNs are often very helpful uh, to, when dealing with out of vocabulary words. Uh, so what, what it is basically use the CNN to create word level representations. So even if the word's not in your, let's say, complete word vocabulary, you can create a new, uh, a new representation for the word that kind of complements this, this out of vocabulary problem. Uh, yeah, and like I said, at, at the same time, anytime you need a relatively accurate but fast classifier, these are these are great models to try out. Um, moving on, we have recurrent neural networks. I'm sure most people are are familiar with LSTMs or uh, GRUs to some extent. Uh, we use them a lot in NLP because they yeah, they're a, a natural model for for language. If you think of language as kind of a sequence of of words. Uh, so the, the strengths of, of these are obviously, they're, they're really strong baselines really for anything language related. Most things language related are, can be construed as a sequence. Uh, so, so using this kind of propagation through time is, is great. Uh, also theoretically, they can learn arbitrarily long distance relationships. So if you have, let's say, uh, a, an example would be a sentence like, uh, I don't know where he's going to where and to you know, have some kind of connection here. Uh, and you'd expect that the, an LSTM would be slightly better than a convolutional neural net at picking up these kind of long distance relationships in, inside of uh, sentences. Uh, finally, there's, there was at least at some point in time in 2017, the, uh, the folk knowledge was that anytime you wanted a 